Well, um, thank you for joining us this afternoon, folks. My name is Larry Reagan. I'm with the EdTech Network, and it is a pleasure to have you here this afternoon for our second EdTech Connect. Uh, this program, sponsored by the Educational Technology Network, is an opportunity to uh, find out what our uh, famous and brilliant faculty at Penn State are doing. And I'm going <coughs> to introduce you to my colleague, uh, Conrad Tucker, here in a second. Uh, I'll let you know, I was just sharing with Conrad, our plan for the EdTech Connect project is to do three, four of these over the year, uh, depending on circumstances, depending on faculty's interest in, in where you are in your research. So if you have something in the field of AI that you might like to share and get out to a broader audience, please let me know. We'll figure out timing and all of that to make it happen. Uh, we're currently working on our next program for May 9th or thereabouts. Uh, I don't want to say a whole bunch about that because we've got to nail down some of the details, but that will be our next one. But if you're interested in hosting one of these, and matter of fact, I have to say Conrad, aside from being one of my uh, faculty heroes, Conrad is also part of the genesis of this program. In, in a conversation about two years ago, we were talking about what, what do you need as a faculty member at Penn State, what do you need by the way of um, support in this field and he said I need to know what other faculty members are doing and the kind of projects they are working on and he said I want to know about opportunities to collaborate and, and work together and I that's where the connect program kind of <coughs> kind of came out so thank you for that Conrad and, and today we're gonna uh, hear about Conrad's research in this I'll let him do the, the the more formal but I want to thank you for both the genesis of the idea and also for taking time to present with us today so thank, thank you, you. All right, thank you very much, Larry, and uh, thank you to the uh, EdTech Network for providing me this opportunity. Uh, Larry tends to um, hype <laughs> me up, so I just want to no hype, the expectations. No hype. <laughs> uh, I'm just, uh, you know, uh, regular faculty, I'm just glad to be given the opportunity to be here. We put leather uh, chairs up front to try to entice <laughs> faculty and students to sit up front, but yet it, it just never works out. But uh, You didn't mention the $10 under the cushion. That is true. Right? There's, <laughs> there's some money under there, too. Um, we're going to try to make this interactive. It's not going to be me just uh, talking. And so as I actually go through the, uh, my talk, I am going to solicit feedback from the audience. Um, and, and the reason is I want us to collectively see where this field is going and what actually motivates uh, this kind of uh, trajectory that I've been on since uh, arriving at Penn State. So the primary motivation uh, is actually a grand challenge from the uh, National Academies of Engineering. They have several of these grand challenges, but one of them is the advancement of personalized learning. Now, the reason why they call it a grand challenge is because it's really, really hard to do. And as you will see from the talk today, uh, it demonstrates the reasons why advancing personalized learning is, is difficult. But the motivation is clear. We want to advance personalized learning so that each and every learner uh, feels that their needs are being met uh, towards their trajectory of attaining some knowledge that they uh, find useful. So from an engineering point of view, this is our ideal scenario. Uh, you have uh, an instructor here that is carefully attentive to a student uh, and, and focused. And so my first question is, why don't we see this in our uh, classrooms? Audience, and I will call on you. Why don't we see this in our classrooms? Yes? It's expensive. It's expensive. What else? Like safety. Safety in, in terms of? Like I'm just thinking of um, risk management. OK, so risk management. There's always one risk management in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> There are just too many students. It's, it's difficult to scale, right? Any, anyone else? So these are the challenges. So what do we end up with? We end up with scenarios like this. So this is actually my uh, undergraduate engineering uh, design class. It's a lab where students were actually building prototypes. I am somewhere in there. But as you can see, I have been overwhelmed by the number of students. Now, there's really no possible way that I could provide individual feedback and guidance to uh, each and every student. So what happens is, uh, you know, with the help of TAs or their own team members, students go through some type of uh, trial and, and error. So more formally stated, this is the problem, right? We have more 
uh, learners, then we have uh, providers of knowledge, and this is a scalability problem. And this is actually what motivated my first NSF grant, is how do we, in the classroom, try to mitigate some of these challenges? So what if we could transform that picture that you saw there to something like this? Now, I'll explain what these systems are, but you can think of these as uh, some type of uh, machine learning and hardware that observes what a student's doing and provides feedback to help uh, reduce the burden on the, uh, on the instructor. Now, we're not saying that uh, these machines are going to replace teachers or teacher's assistants. <coughs> what we are saying is that they will help reduce the kind of mundane tasks of the instructor so that the instructor can provide more relevant and uh, in-depth feedback. And let me give you an analogy. So many years ago, are there any WordPerfect generations? I'm dating myself. WordPerfect, before there were Word and Google Docs. Well, spell checks came about um, in an attempt to reduce the challenges of um, spelling. So imagine this was uh, a piece of text written by uh, an engineer and what a spell check would help do is identify the, the grammar in the sentence. And for those engineers in the audience, the, the spelling mistakes are engineer, uh, grammar. <laughs> but that, that's, you know, that's, that's what a spell check does, right? It helps you identify mundane things. And then that allows an instructor to answer a higher level thing that an, an algorithm up until this point can't really answer, such as, is this piece of uh, document or text journal worthy or is it publishable? Those are the more in-depth types of questions that we want our instructors uh, spending more time on. So we created this kind of um, system here. It's a do-it-yourself robot. Uh, pieces of it are actually right, right there. But it's a tablet. It has a connect on it. And at the, the heart of this is a big data uh, um, device. It captures multiple types of data pertaining to how a student is interacting in a classroom, uh, learns over time, and then provides students with uh, feedback. So let me show you an example of what the, the, the eyes of the robot, so if you are uh, seeing. So one of the algorithms is some type of neural network that's able to identify objects in an environment. Uh, as you can see here, so now this student um, walks in using the same type of computer vision algorithms. You can identify things that a student uh, has or is using. I cannot, I cannot tell you how much time I spent personally going to students to say, you know you're supposed to have your goggles on, you know you're supposed to have your lab coat. This is time that an uh, intelligent feedback system could help provide students with, uh, and this is all in real time in, in terms of the identification and the uh, detection. Now, there are many things you want to do beyond just identifying things, right? You want to guide a student towards uh, a specific type of behavior, let's say, in a, in a lab. So if this student is hammering, how are they actually hammering in an effort to uh, improve the manner in which they are performing this task? So. Uh, the same sensor is actually able to capture the skeletal uh, uh, movements of the student. And you can see it actually changing color when there's a potentially risky type of uh, action being taken by uh, the student. So now you have a scenario where students in a lab are able to get some day-to-day uh, -day feedback on things that uh, they do on an um, on a pretty routine basis, which reduces the burden of an instructor to provide very high level, um, high level feedback. Now, this is great, you know, we, you know, we're in the classroom, but there's still a limitation. And I want you to give me some feedback. What, what are some of the limitations, even with this effort? Yes? So, is it maybe a question and maybe a limitation? So, the, from the point the, the from the point the student picks up the hammer mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, up until the point something breaks, there is possibly a very small window of time. And uh, I, even though you detect, um, you know, you're able to detect that, uh, if you want a meaningful intervention, uh, how would you do that? Would you just put on a cop siren or something? <laughs> right. So the, uh, the intervention part is, is critical. There are many different ways that you can uh, approach this. In terms of the speed of detection, the, these cameras are actually capturing 30 frames per second. So that moving from actual detection to a classification of a potential anomaly, not necessarily that this is dangerous, but just the anomaly can actually happen uh, quite rapidly. Now, the intervention mechanism that would help uh, correct a behavior, that, that's an open question. Um, in fact, there's a, an entire body of research on gamification and behavior change. How do you actually change uh, behavior? So in addition to, let's say, the speed or the type of intervention, what is still the limitation of trying to have how many of these would you have in your in a university like Penn State? How many labs do we have? Lots, right? How many of these devices would you need per lab? So what are the limitations? Well, the limitations still are that um, you still have to buy these, each of these. You have to install it. You have to, um, um, it, it's geographically constrained. So if our true goal is to um, reach as many students and, and have them connected with the Penn State learning process. This is actually quite limiting because it's constrained to the physical environment. Yes? Is it also theoretically a, still a one-to-one -one ratio that one student walked into one lab, one camera, or if you had a room full of people, would it be able to detect multiple kinds of that, sources? That's a great question. So. Um, this specific camera, and, and, and by the way, advancements have been made even beyond this, uh, the Connect system. You can actually do what we did here with just any regular um, video camera. But at the time, this camera could capture uh, eight individuals simultaneously. So with one of these devices, you could possibly uh, capture the, the body movements and patterns. of. But still a constraint. Eliminating but still a constraint, a constraint uh, nevertheless. And the most important constraint that we um, wanted to mitigate is the geographic constraint. Uh, we have a uh, world-class online um, distance-based uh, education program here at Penn State. This would, also, this would not be able to provide them um, with that type of real-time feedback. So that motivates us to go beyond just physical systems that we have in a lab setting. What we want to do is connect the physical world with the digital world. Well, there are many ways of communicating something going on in this room, right? I could call someone at a distance. I could have some type of uh, Skype or video uh, conference. I could try to create three-dimensional representations of the room. Or I could actually physically bring the person uh, to this space. Now, mm. the challenge of bringing people to Penn State is that it's costly for them, and we just are constrained by the physical buildings that we have. Well, you could say, well, how about we take all the experts and we professors kind of go on a, a tour of uh, knowledge dissemination. Well, that's also not scalable. So here we are faced with the scalability challenge once again. How do we go about mitigating this? So we're trying to uh, advanced personalized learning, not just from a physical space, but also in the digital environment. Now, how do we actually even know what the needs of a student are in the digital environment? And how do we advance personalized learning in this space? Currently, this is the system we have, right? Where you have a bunch of computers connected to the internet, you're watching some YouTube video, or you're reading some text, really isn't interactive or um, uh, immersive. I think the Shannon model is really a great conceptual model to help explain what it is that we're trying to do. How many people have seen the Shannon model? Okay, so he's actually one of my heroes. He doesn't get enough credit because the way he explained the world just makes so much sense to me. He said everything in the world has a source and a receiver. 
And in between there, there's information uh, flowing, and there's some type of feedback uh, loop. So in the context of education, who would the source be? All right, so the instructor is a source. We either stand in front of our students, or we are teaching some online course. And of course, I've given away uh, the receivers, or obviously the students or learners. This can be both in the physical form or the digital form. Now the message, this is the bottleneck for personalized learning, whether or not it's in the physical classroom or in the digital space. The speed at which you need to customize your environment just can't keep up with the, uh, the needs of the, the learners. So this is where we're trying to make advancements, both in the physical space and in the, the digital space. So well, how do we go about doing that? Well, we have created a virtual learning environment built on some platforms and some of the uh, members in the audience have used. Uh, this is in, in Unity. And uh, using virtual reality, you can actually interact and be immersed in a similar way that you can be in, uh, in the real world. Uh, there isn't the tactile component, but at least you have the immersive component. And so here's a video of, for those of you who haven't seen what I'm describing, of um, this is one of my students. In this world, you can see it's very interactive. It, it kind of mimics the types of physics in the uh, real world. I'm glad the students don't, aren't on a destructive path as <laughs> this. Well, you can do that, right? Um, someone mentioned risk earlier, right? Now you have the ability to uh, use that bandsaw without uh, potentially injuring uh, a student or um, you know having higher risk uh, as opposed to other physical representations so um, how do we create this visual this virtual world well you can physically manually create all of these uh, environments but that requires a lot of human capital right or you can say, well, I'm going to capture this environment with some type of sensing system. So what you see here is um, my PhD student who is in, uh, let's say, one part of the world with a 3D scanner. Actually, it's the same scanner that was on this uh, robot. And as he moves around this environment, you can actually see the physical world being recreated in this digital space, right? So reduces the burden of the instructor or the designer to actually create digital um, content. Uh, you have a student in this virtual reality that's actually experiencing what this physical, uh, this virtual space is. Yes? Can I, just a, a half a step here on, on this particular um concept, as the system is uh, capturing this physical space and mm -hmm. creating basically a rendering of it, right. does that rendering then forever exist and could be repurposed? I, I know one of the issues okay. there is the speed of developing that space. So mm -hmm. I was always curious, does it, um, does it permanently exist so the next time I step into it, poof, it's there? Or does the system regenerate it again? How does that? Yeah, so that's, um, this can actually physically exist so long as you have uh, uh, storage. Okay. So once it is created, uh, and that's what Kevin here is experiencing, um, that lasts forever. But it's still, it's, yes. Kind of following up to the like, question, does your system I mean, I see the students sort of running around a very small space. Mm -hmm. And uh, does your virtual reality adjust to that particular space? I mean, you know, have you heard of uh, Microsoft uh, HoloLens? Mm -hmm. Basically, it can sort of you, you directly adjust to your current environment, whatever setup you have. So I'm just curious. Uh, right. So th there's a stark difference between virtual reality and augmented reality. And I think uh, each has its place depending on the type of learning objective that you're trying to um, accomplish. In this example that uh, was provided, where you have, you're, you're trying to uh, duplicate the physical space that you have, um, a 
a virtual reality experience would be more representative of trying to replicate, um, replicate that experience. Now, in terms of motion, like you, you mentioned, yes, the, uh, the student that was in this view uh, really had a very small um, movement area. But you don't necessarily have to physically move in the space. You can actually navigate with some type of uh, controller, like a, a joystick. Um, so it just depends on the type of problem that you're, you're trying to solve. But once you've created this environment, uh, you're actually, it, it exists there f um, forever. But there's still limitations, because even though you've created this environment, who's going to be the person that scans here? Who's going to be this person that walks around with a scanner? You still have this limitation of the creation of content and the need to personalize learning. If this student that's experiencing this learns better in uh, a stadium environment, well, how do you create that environment? So, still tormented by this quest of personalization, is what motivated us to um, move from this ability to recreate an environment to an ability to teach a computer how to create environments. Because that's the holy grail. If you can teach a computer and reduce the human burden on creating environments and creating content, then you can, it's almost like Lego pieces, right? Then you can mix and match and, and put things uh, together. Which brings me to uh, some very brand new research that we just got funded, funding from DARPA from that deals with uh, um, deep neural networks. And the type of neural network that I'm going to talk about today are generative adversarial networks. Now, this is just a fancy term of saying uh, there are two networks that are playing some type of game between each other. And I'll explain what I mean by that um, right here. Now, how many people are experts in neural networks? Or have heard the term neural networks? Or at least heard. Well, um, a neural, uh, GANs are unique in the sense that you can think of this as the, uh, the constant struggle between a counterfeiter and the FBI. Right? The goal of the counterfeiter is to make the best type of fake $100 bill that fools an FBI agent. And every time they fail, they go to jail, but they learn something, right? They learn that something was wrong with this, but the FBI agent also learns, right? The FBI agent learns that, oh, wow, they're getting very good at this. And this, is, this actually is how we end up changing our currency to, to always try to keep one step above uh, the, um, the, the crooks. So it's, GANs work in a similar way. And on one hand, you have the generator. Now, you can think of the generator as being trained on how to create things. So imagine uh, you want to teach a computer how to create a car. That's what a generator learns. It learns how to create something. But how do you know what a car looks like? How do you, how do you know that a car is a car? Is this a car? Why not? Very good. So our audience and the guest just became the discriminator. Mm -hmm. And so I, I showed him my design and said, this is my best guess at what a car is. And he throws it back and says, that can po not possibly be a car. And so I go back to the drawing board, and I learn from that feedback, which was very good feedback. So I make it bigger for people to walk, uh, um, be in, and so on and so forth. And it's an iterative process until I show you uh, an image that you are convinced could possibly be a car. And now, using this kind of um, game, it's not, you can think of it as it's actually a game theoretic uh, approach. You've reached a Nash equilibrium where the uh, solution is that I've created something that, that you actually fool by. Now, um, Here's the digital version of that, right? Now, imagine you just have a blob. And this blob is trying to morph itself into a car. Now, remember, it has no idea what, 
a car. Is it, you, you're seeing that, and this is a computer actually just changing itself. And you can see here it's constantly morphing. And, and you can actually take this and, and uh, it, it is computer readable and you can actually eventually 3D print it. This is using the same type of geometry that we teach our students in CAD. Uh, it's the triangular mesh, it's manifold. You can eventually send this to a, a 3D printer. And so you can co continuously modify this blob until it has properties that look like a car. Now, the question is, well, how would you do that? What, what are you going to train your network uh, how to do? You have a lot of domain knowledge that you have picked up along the years. You've seen many cars in your lifetime. Uh, you understand um, aspects of, of physics, and you're using that knowledge to kind of guide my, my um, process. Now the question is, well, can we teach a computer um, how to get some semblance of our physical world? Well, then how do we go about doing that? Well, why don't we just give this computer an entire universe that's a simulation? And that's what you see here. So this is a very popular gaming engine called Unity. And in essence, we are having the computer learn about concepts, physical concepts, or laws of nature, in this uh, simulation environment. So imagine giving some type of neural network this helicopter. And it has no idea of what a helicopter is or how they fly, but all it has is the cockpit of a helicopter. And it's going to fail a lot. But it doesn't matter because it's failing in a virtual environment. And over time, it actually learns how to fly a helicopter or a jet or a rocket. And the way it does that is um, this entire domain of research called reinforcement learning. Has anyone heard of reinforcement? Now, reinforcement learning actually started from the social scientists. It's, it's interesting how the, the disciplines are blending, right? The, the, these lines of you're an engineer or you're a so it, it doesn't really matter because concepts actually from one area are actually very relevant to another. Um, and I, I know this because my two-year-old is learning in a reinforcement learning. He's born, he wants to put everything in his mouth. Now, that, those are his actions. The reward is... Not that much, because most things aren't edible, right? <laughs> and actually, I have to, I know that, so I, I prevent him from putting most things in his mouth. And over time, this is how we learn, right? Through trial and error, whether or not it is the feedback that we get from uh, negative outcomes, or it's the feedback that we get from our parents or friends, that prevent us from having negative outcomes. The concept actually, this is why I was born in the social sciences, because it's actually a, a human-based or a biological-based concept. And it's that same concept we're applying to machine learning, where you have this object, you can call it a blob, the computer can move some things on it, and depending on the things it moves, it gets a reward or a penalty. And sometimes, uh, most times, it's a penalty when it starts off. But over time, it learns the things that it has to move to be rewarded. Now, here's a quiz. Are you ready? I'm going to show you two videos. And I'm going to ask you, what is the difference between the two videos? Now, watch carefully. The videos I'm going to show you are actually the computer uh, learning in this environment. And I'm going to ask you, well, what is it? What is, the, what is the difference between the two? Now, I'm going to tell you what the objective is. The objective is there's this, um, there's this slab of wood, and it has to learn how to attach these two pieces of wood together. Now, here's our virtual um, space. So here's the training process. You can see the rewards changing over time.
Okay. Now let's see. Fast forward after it has learned for some time. I'm going to show you a separate video, and I want you to tell me what is the difference between its the actions it was taking. So here's the second video. All right, who can take a guess? What is the difference between the two videos? Like the last one has the sort of two poles competing against each other. One okay, goes up, so the other the goes first down. During the training, you only had one. Oh, so what are these, first of all? Nails, nail and screws. <coughs> so the computer is learning that if you want to attach two pieces of wood together with a hammer, it's Physically, right, so there's physics embedded in this. It's physically better to hammer a nail into wood than hammer a screw into wood. Just because of the physics of the screw, screws aren't meant to be hammered. And that's what's happening here, right? And if you go back to the first training, when it's training, um, you see that it was trying uh, screws a lot. Because it didn't know any better. But every time it tried screw, it got penalized because there was more damage to the wood by using screws. And it also learns that if you're trying to fasten two pieces of wood, it's probably a good idea to fasten it at two uh, in more than just one place. Right? This is not gonna, it's not the best way to attach two pieces of wood. So when you See here, it really doesn't attach this second nail here. When it's trained here, you see that the uh, frequency of attaching the second nail is more, and also the frequency of choosing nails, it's more. And this is without it even knowing anything about nails and screws. And what's more fascinating in the, the field of deep learning is that this is all being learned by pixels. This, the idea sounds crazy. All that you gave this, this algorithm were these tiny little dots that make up this picture. And it learns that uh, you know, the snail in this location has these gray pixels. And when I move it, it the, this image looks different. And that's how it's learning. Yes. So my, uh, and Simon uh, will go next if you don't mind. Uh, so my question is how does, the, how does the system know what the physical rules are around a nail and a screw? Is that, is it, you're talking about a neural network, is it going back to some f logic or some laws of physics? Right, so it's not, going back to the laws of physics, because it doesn't know laws of physics mm. when it starts off. All it's given, and I'll go back to this environment, all it's given is this environment that already has physics embedded into it. It would be like, uh, you know, a baby's born into the world and they have very little understanding of our, our world. But the, the physics of the world already exists and it just, uh, is dropped into this world, and then it learns through its actions. Now, going back to this uh, image, there are th only there are actually just three things that happen in could deep I, reinforcement. Could I check just yes. real quick to see if Simon, because he had a follow-up okay. question yeah, sure. if you, before you go on. I have a very similar question. Yes. It, it's how do you measure, measure success? So what I'm assuming uh -huh. is that there's an input, there's an algorithm, and there's an output. Yes. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that success looks like and what the algorithm is, which I think is what yeah, you're talking yeah. about. Right. So the objective is let's hammer, attach the, the, these two pieces of wood, right? That's the, the goal. The question is, well, how, do, how does it know what's better and worse? Um, since you have rewards and penalties, so if you go back to this, when it's, you can see the reward, um, the reward changing over here. It is based on, and this is similar in the real world, the goal is if you hammer a piece of wood with a nail versus uh, a screw, 
there's going to be more damage to the wood. And so that is what uh, is considered a penalty in, the, uh, in this environment. If the goal is to hammer these, attach these two pieces of wood without causing damage, like we would tell a student in, in a real classroom, the student um, is rewarded, let's say based on a grade, of accomplishing that task without damaging the wood. And so that's how we're formulating this also with rewards and penalties based on the actions that are taken. I'm not sure if, I'd, and please feel free to delve deeper into Where does the question. algorithm come from? The algorithm comes from, I mean, we, we think of it as just a brain. We put it into the environment. OK, so you've input a set of rules. We've input um, this neural network that has these three variables that it can control. So, so the, the physics is captured in the reward function. So somebody sure. wrote that uh, to capture that uh, you know, if uh, you only nail it on one side, that's not as good. You don't get as much reward if you nail it on, if it doesn't move. Uh, so there's a model which says whether it'll move or not, I, I'm presuming. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't move, then you get a higher reward. So it's as if uh, uh, you are grading a student's paper and you're giving them a grade uh, and you're not telling them exactly anything about why it is wrong. And it's, they're trying many different answers. But when you are doing the reward function, then you know, then you're checking certain properties of good nailing. Yeah. So, yeah, over time, the only thing that the algorithm controls are, are the actions it takes, right? Whether or not it takes a screw or a nail and where it places, where it hammers those screws and nails. Um, when it does that, it gets a reward or a penalty. And over time, the idea is that it learns that uh, it gets a higher reward when it chooses uh, nails, and it gets an even higher reward where it chooses two nails, because that uh, attaches a piece of wood better than having just one nail. But I just, it's important to understand that these aren't if-else rules. We're not coming up with because there are just too many combinations. We just give it the environment, and we give it the actions that it can do in that environment, and then it learns the relationships between the actions and what it's rewarded for. Very good questions. OK, so I hope you see by these two examples just the ability to, uh, to train over time. Once you can achieve this, right, then you can start having blobs that change and that do things. And to put all of this together, we've created actually a, a website. And this is actually what you're seeing here are, is a 2D version. And these are all computer generated sketches of boats. So uh, we taught a computer how to sketch. And if you think of from an education point of view, you have a question that you want to ask a student. Let's say a physics question. But you know, they have more experience. They've been sailing all their lives. Right? It's the same physics, but you want to you frame the question in the context that they would understand or be more comfortable with. So then you have a computer generate a boat, and then you ask a question about you know, what is the friction of you know, the particles acting on the boat, or whatever the physics question would be. Another student is, is more comfortable with chairs you generate a chair. Mm -hmm. Now we start moving towards personalized learning that's, that's scalable. So what you see here um, is the computer just generated these four sketches. Um, this simulation environment, this is actually on a particle level interaction. right? So you can think, think of these as water mo molecules bouncing off of each other. You can, you can get as complex or, or um, general as you want depending on the hardware capabilities that you have. But similar to how I showed in the previous example of the computer learning to hammer, this is the computer learning about what boats actually would make good sailing boats. Now let's get a vote on the audience. Out of these four boats, which do you think would be the best at floating? 
Uh, boat number one. Boat number two. Number three. Four. All right. My, why four? I don't know. The hole is not quite as deep as the other ones, and it's longer. Okay. It's hole is deep and longer. Uh, what else? More balanced. Center of gravity looks lower. Center of gravity. What's a major design flaw in boat number three? The weight of the um, the the piece that's above the the hull. Okay, so the the, the weight, but the hull isn't even connected. You see, See it here? Mm. Water is going to go in to that. It's a horrible <laughs> design, right? And what you want to teach, what the, the computer is going to learn over time is that, well, if I'm drawing hulls, they probably shouldn't have uh, missing uh, edges in this. And it learns that in that same reinforcement learning type of approach by taking each of these sketches dropping it in this uh, simulation environment hmm. and running it over time. So um, from our previous conversation, the, the physics of water are already embedded into this scenario. Right. Okay. And so it just tests each of these designs that it's generated here, and it weeds out the ones that really mm -hmm. aren't great. And so when it's, if it's creating a, 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 a um, a course material for a student, for example, it's not showing things that physically are, are mm -hmm. wrong, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to, um, to confuse um, mm -hmm. a student. And over time, this is how the, um, the, the system learns. And that's, uh, that's currently with the project that we have going on right now. So right here, it's uh, 2D. But um, where we definitely want to take this is uh, three-dimensional mm -hmm. objects and a same, similar kind of concept. And the idea is that you can create anything, and now they become building blocks that you can create a virtual reality um, environment. On. So be before you summarize, can I ask a question, Conrad? Yes. So the, the, con the context is what we're discussing here. We're, we're trying to create an environment where based on some knowledge of preference, mm -hmm. um, like I might like to study physics, as you said, in a stadium, somebody else might like to study it in a classroom, whatever. Right. Somehow we garner that from the learner, mm -hmm. where you must come from. Then the system const basically constructs that world for me. Yes. And then my learning takes place in, in so we're, we're learning the same physical concepts. Yes my concept and now I feel more comfortable because I'm in a stadium yep. somebody else is that absolutely that's, okay that's, that's how exactly, we're personalizing that's exactly what we're trying to do okay and um, that's uh, we believe is a scalable version of personalization because you know and this has been over years mm. we've been it started in the physical realm mm. but it's always been this roadblock well how do you scale this mm. and now in the digital space we finally um, come across uh, an approach that could possibly be scalable because you ha you can customize on the fly with minimal um, input from the designer. Mm. Yeah, there's a question. Here. How do you know what each learner their uh, uh, the question is? How do you know uh, for each learner what their desired, let's say, uh, physical space is for right. learning? How do you figure well, that out? You can ask them one or there are things that we don't even know that we like to do. And I think this is where there's going to be a convergence of uh, mobile. Think of your Fitbit integrating with your classroom experience. So you, you're really learning uh, about each individual through multiple devices that they have that, that actually capture um, their own data. Because you're absolutely right. There may be things that I like, or there may be ways that I, I would make more of an effective learning environment that I may not even be aware of. Now, this is where the big data comes in, where you can actually learn that on the fly and then recommend that to uh, the student themselves. Conrad, I'm wondering if it's reasonable 
um, as this gets started, mm -hmm. that we that the system would generate I don't know ten scenarios. Right? Mm -hmm. Here's a stadium. Here's a soccer field. Here's a classroom. Here's a musical, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, a concert area. So in order to minimize the amount of scenarios or context, uh -huh. but as it learns, then mm -hmm. as the system becomes more complex, it generates other kinds of scenarios. Is that a like? Is there any advantage to that? So I, when I go in, it says, "Hey, do you like to listen to music?" Uh -huh. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I do. Do you like to go to concerts? Yes. Now it places me into that space. Yeah, so I, I think this is where I um, would love feedback from the, the learning and education folks because, mm -hmm. you know, the technology is, is just one component of, of this puzzle, right? The, over, the main objective is does this enhance learning or not? And I've had conversations with um, some folks in the audience in trying to see what are the learning outcomes. And to, for that, you need a study. To, to measure if I customize this environment versus the, the one-size-fits-all approach, are there differences and uh, how does the level of customization actually influence the, my performance? Mm. And that may differ based on the student. Sir. So I, I think this is a follow-up uh, to this point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you and I have had a conversation uh, uh, as a sort of computationally minded psychologist, mm -hmm. my focus is on the person who is doing the learning. So I, you know, your, your work is wonderful, but I see huge gaps between what the computer is learning and generating, what the actual person, the student is doing. So I think we, we, this is a big conversation to be had, of course. The other part that uh, I'm more interested in is uh, what, you know, once you get the data, the big data, how do you go about analyzing the data and then tailor that to individual differences in the learning? So I guess, you know, understanding the individual differences from the big data, I think is the other part that I'm really interested in uh, so that we can connect to provide feedback in different ways to different people. I, I think that will be really exciting uh, in the right, future. Right, and I, Larry, th this is exactly why um, events such as the EdTech Network are, are critical because it brings together uh, individuals from multiple disciplines and we don't have all the answers. I mean, we, you, rightly so, we've been focusing more on the technology and I think there's a, uh, there's a strong emphasis on how does this really influence uh, learning and hopefully this um, sets the foundation for some potential uh, federal proposal ideas that we can pull together our uh, resources and interests and really try to transform uh, learning and, and move the needle towards personalized learning. You know, just to uh, play off on that, Conrad, and it's, I, I think your point's a great one. You're working on constructing the domain in which we can do these things. Mm -hmm. You could benefit by the use of an educational psychologist or an instructional, some, who's focused then on, sir, to your point, the learning that's happening in here. So can we then modify, uh, I'm not getting the physics lesson about the hammer. Mm -hmm. Does the system need to adjust to me, maybe back me up a little bit in the laws of physics and so forth? Right. So I think that interdisciplinary comment you made very early on mm -hmm. is, is absolutely crucial here, is that we've got different lenses and different eyes of looking at this. Right. Uh, and I wanted to point you to, I'm sorry Simon had to zip out, uh -huh. um, there's a faculty member, actually a, a Penn State grad here who's at Georgia, University of Georgia, Lloyd Reber, uh, who did work in, in the 80s and all on something called situated learning. And his research, I can connect you up with Lloyd, uh, had to do with that context. How important is context? to how we learn and grasp knowledge. That would be, I think, maybe some additional information as well. Yeah, that would be a great yeah. resource. Other yeah. questions, comments? Anyone, sir? Thanks. Um, in this example you're showing yes. with the boat, uh -huh. are we still talking about adversarial networks here? No, so here, here's the reinforcement learning component. right? Okay. So the adversarial network generates these um, boat designs. The reinforcement learning evaluates the feasibility of the generated design. Okay. Now, you bring, you bring up a good point. That's exactly our next step, right? Uh, since the adversarial networks are generating and discriminating, right? 
when the discriminator evaluated these designs, it only did so visually. So these, these all look like boats. Where we want to go next is giving the discriminator more intelligence by grounding it in the physical components. So you can think of the output here feeding back into the training data set right. to uh, result in boats that have a higher probability of that's what I started thinking about it. Yeah. You would start throwing waves or weather conditions right. or something like that that would be yeah. likely to sink a poor design. That's that's exactly where we're okay. going. Yep. Good question. Um, so what about instead of the computer designing the boats, what about a program where the students design the boat or say in my field a cell and then it's graded by the computer system. I mean, that's actually seems to me even a little bit easier. You train your computer to judge what the students create. Yeah, that's... that's, that's that that's, seems to be even easier yeah, than that's this. Yeah, that's to solve... Well, not... Yes, it's a lot easier. Because okay. what you just described is that's the one half of this network. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that's something that can be done Okay, great. Now. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So earlier you talked a little about some of the um, limitations, the constraints, I guess, of the, the systems um, mm -hmm. in terms of the scanning the environment. Mm -hmm. um, has there been much work in terms of looking at um, capturing continuously live environments? And, and because that would be an interesting experience, like especially like an ocean or something like that, mm -hmm. if you had a particular area of the ocean that had um, constantly changing variables in terms of like uh, conditions and weather and things. It'd be really interesting to see how how that kind of system adapts in kind of those complex environments rather than a more controlled, physic physically defined. Right, so in, in essence, having a scanner that you know, works out in the wild. Um, so LIDAR, I think, is the closest thing that comes close to what you're describing where you can capture the, uh, the physical sense. It's still a challenge for certain environments. I'm not sure how well that works with water. I, I know you, have you done some work in, with LiDAR? I know some ARL folks have worked. That's something that we haven't looked into, but it's definitely worth exploring. Yeah. Also, what, um, what, levels of, what levels of education are you, is this focused on? Is it, um, let's say, college, um, high school, middle, you know, uh, elementary ed? What, where, is, where is this focused on? Um, I want to say all. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, Human, we're visual communicators, right? So I could communicate a concept to an elementary school um, kid with a doodle, and if you think of what the advanced version of this is, it's a multi-view engineering drawing, right? We have a three-dimensional view, and that's how we design planes. So I think once you have the ability to start generating visually convincing um, objects, uh, I think there's a lot of potential across different levels of education. You know, I just for a second was thinking of the cell um, scenario that you mentioned, uh, how interesting it would be if the students had the capability of constructing a, a, a living cell, right? And, and they've got to move items in and position them within the cell, and the system is constantly checking to see whether I, is that object there or not. No, you're missing the mitochondria, this is going way back in my cell biology, but you know, you're missing something in here that's, that's necessary. And doing that on that iterative process, I think would really be a fascinating bridge in between these two spaces of the, yeah, that's pretty. Bringing in the different scenarios, for instance, a cell in, in a blood vessel uh, versus a muscle, you know, you could change mm. the, the environment and, mm. and see what the students do. Mm. So. Yeah. That's very nice. So Conrad, we need you to crank this up, bud, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm guessing everybody in the room's got some context that they uh -huh. want to apply this yeah. to. So um, are there any other pressing questions? And Ashley, I should see if there's anything yeah. we're, we're good online. So um, as, we, as we then wrap this up, first of all, I'm, I'm guessing that Conrad would be very open to additional thoughts, additional input. Uh, to these ideas and perhaps bringing your own context and interest to the field. But on behalf of the uh, EdTech Network, thank you. Uh, th this is exactly what we're interested in. We're, tr we're very interested in helping to create these connections and stimulate some of this work. 
Um, and this has been, in my mind, just kind of a mind-boggling uh, experience of where things are going. I do suspect you have a uh, two-year-old at home who's going to be teaching you before too long Maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, what their world is going to right. be like because, I mean, what they're exposed to. But thank you very much for taking the time today. Thank, thank you all for joining us.